Algeria's President Abdelaziz Bouteflika names new caretaker government. Cholera outbreak continues to spread in Mozambique. And politicians in South Africa join in condemnation of xenophobic attacks in Durban. Hello and welcome to CTTN. This is Africa Live and I'm Karen Roberts in Nairobi, also coming up in the program. In business, South Africa set for highest petrol price in five years. And coming up in sports, female referee Sauda Adiro paves way for women in Ugandan rugby. We start in Algeria. President Abdelaziz Bouteflika has named a new caretaker government. The positions of Army Chief of Staff and the Defence Minister were left unchanged, but he appointed new people to fill the posts of Finance Minister, Energy Minister and Foreign Minister. There have been weeks of protests demanding an end to Bouteflika's 20-year rule. The ailing statesman has been abandoned by several of his close allies and the Army. Bouteflika dropped his bid to run for a fifth term but has stopped short of stepping down immediately to wait for a national conference on political change. The Constitutional Council has been tasked to see whether he's still fit for office. Bouteflika has rarely been seen in public since suffering a stroke in 2013. Well, now let's discuss this further. We are joined by Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad. He is Professor of Political Science at the American University in Cairo. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor. The announcement of the caretaker government in Algiers has not done much to quell tensions in Algeria. What options does the current administration have? Well, actually, not much. Uh, what's happening essentially now is an attempt to address this uh, political stalemate, uh, winning time until the parties to the crisis, a different actor there, can uh, negotiate and agree upon the terms of uh, uh, ending the term of, uh, of President Tutaflika. President Tutaflika, of course, term is, is over, but uh, the transition from uh, here to a new regime, new political uh, situation in Algeria. This is uh, a, a very competitive process and uh, the different actors now try to uh, reach an agreement upon that. So where does this leave the country and is the crisis, do you think, likely to continue? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think that the crisis is likely to continue until uh, the agreement is reached. We know that the uh, army chief has demanded the uh, constitutional uh, council to declare President Bouteflika unfit for the job, uh, which means that uh, if, if this is the case, if the, 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 uh, the council uh, convene and make such a, a declaration, in this case, it, uh, the, the, the issue will go to the hand to the parliament, the two chambers of the parliament uh, and this, they will uh, convene together and will decide whether they would accept uh, the, the, the ruling of the Constitutional Council or not. A uh, two-thirds majority is needed in this case and I think this is something that is uh, uh, not easy to obtain considering how divided the ruling elite in Algeria is. Uh, uh, in the meantime, there are uh, possibilities of, uh, of President Bouteflika resigning, actually, and this will be another alternative or another uh, way to exit out, out of this strategy, of this, of this crisis. Uh, this would rather make the situation a little easier if uh, President uh, Bouteflika opt for uh, uh, resignation. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, that was Dr. Gamal Abdel Gawad, Professor of Political Science at the American University in Cairo. Moving on to other news now. In Mozambique, the number of cholera cases has jumped to 271. That, the numbers have almost doubled in the past 24 hours. And the port city of Beira has recorded its first cholera death. That since the cyclone, according to health officials. The country has been battling to control the epidemic in the cyclone-hit central city of Beira. The Chinese government has since sent doctors to help fight the outbreak 
in the place. According to the World Health Organization, 900,000 cholera vaccine doses are expected to arrive soon, with a vaccination campaign to start later this week. Well, for more on this, we are now joined by Tawanda Makombo, a research analyst at the South Africa Institute of Race Relations, specializing in health and communications. Thank you for joining us. As cholera begins to spread among the victims of Cyclone Ida, can you give us an update on the current situation there? Well, uh, first and foremost, it is important to note that um, Cyclone Idai caused a massive damage to the city of Beira and uh, about 90% of the city was destroyed. And uh, considering that Beira is like the fourth largest city in Mozambique with a dense population of, about, uh, of approximately over half a million people, uh, cholera and other waterborne diseases were inevitable. But however, the government of Mozambique is doing uh, what it can best to provide proper sanitation to the victims um, in terms of water and um, places to stay. Let's talk a little about the vaccines. The World Health Organization says at least 900,000 cholera vaccine doses are expected to arrive today. Can you give us more details on the vaccination campaign there? Yes, uh, the World Health Organization are sending 900,000 oral, oral, oral vaccines to, to Mozambique and uh, they are expected to arrive today, which is Monday. And um, also on top of that, the World Health Organization have set up about seven clinics which will only be treating cholera, uh, um, relate, cholera victims or cholera-related uh, cases. And also China, they've also sent their medical experts to Mozambique so that they can help to cure cholera and tackle the problem. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. That was Tawanda Makombo, research analyst at the SAIRR, specializing in health and communications. In Zimbabwe, the United Nations will this week launch a multi-million dollar appeal to help the country's government address the humanitarian emergency there. On Sunday, the organization's refugee agency donated over 80 metric tons of aid to Zimbabwe's communities affected by Cyclone Idai. Here's CGTN's Farai Makatuya with more. A timely delivery of critical supplies that will help Zimbabwe mitigate the ongoing humanitarian crisis. 80 tons of non-food aid has been flown into the country and is due to be dispatched to the eastern highlands where it will assist some 10,000 people. More is on the way as the UN launches an emergency appeal for funds to avert waterborne diseases and to meet the immediate needs of those displaced by the deadly cyclone. 60 million will cover food need, medicine need, early element of recovery, shelters, uh, some of the basic water sanitation and logistic support to reach it, as well as non-food items in terms of tents, uh, you know, temporary accommodation, uh, the cooking facilities. Zimbabwe's government has deployed its strategic grain reserves to feed survivors and has given assurances there is adequate food for all the affected. Beyond the immediate relief, Zimbabwe requires long-term financial support to recover from the worst climate-induced disaster ever seen here, the losses of which are still being counted. We had 182 people who had died and we had over 300 people missing. That, that is a tragedy. And then we are looking at the destruction of uh, bridges, schools, churches, the loss of livestock, basically the loss of everything that people owned. The death toll is expected to rise as more of the missing are found amongst the ruin. Sniffer dogs from neighboring South Africa brought in to comb the ravaged terrain have narrowed the search area to 16 sites where those who are unaccounted for and presumed dead may be lying beneath the rubble. Farai Makutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe.
Two South Africa now politicians have condemned the xenophobic attacks in the coastal city of Durban. Foreign nationals who reside in the city's informal settlement were attacked last week. Many sought refuge in community halls, mosques and police stations. The xenophobic attacks continue to dominate news headlines and Twitter. President Cyril Ramaphosa says xenophobia has no place in South Africa. Nkuzazana Dlamini Zuma has pleaded with South Africa not to attack fellow Africans. And Julius Malema says foreigners are not taking jobs. International Relations Minister Lindiwe Sisulu has called an urgent meeting of African ambassadors to discuss attacks on foreign nationals. She's also called on law enforcement officers to deal with those damaging properties with the full might of the law. Let's get you more on this story. We're now joined live by CGTN's Angelo Coppola, who is in Johannesburg for us. We've seen various leaders there condemning the attacks. Can you give us an update on what exactly is happening in Durban right now? Karen, it's still tense in Durban. Uh, the authorities there have been trying to monitor the situation in those informal settlements. The issue there, though, is that they're loath to go into those informal settlements. So what is fueling these acts of hate on foreigners? Uh, we know it's not the first time. Well, I mean, Karen, this has been going on for years. We were, we were reporting on the xenophobic attacks in 2015, 2017. The 2015 ones were in Durban. They were horrendous. And it seems like it's politically uh, stimulated, as it were. This particular round seems to have started when the country's president made some comments about people op opening illegal businesses in townships and the fact that the government or authorities in those areas would clamp down on those illegal business operators. And there was an implication there that it was foreign nationals who were operating these illegal businesses. So it seems to have started that way. And if you look at the fact that we are currently in an election year, people and uh, political parties are using um, this fear of foreign nationals as a, an electioneering campaign tool um, for whatever purpose. So at the moment it seems like it's politically motivated. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa, as you said, just issued a statement recently, about an hour ago, um, saying that they, d they don't want any kind of uh, attack on any kind of foreigner, regardless of who they are and where they come from. So it seems to be politically motivated at the moment, Karen. And finally, Angelo, there's a meeting scheduled to take place today with African ambassadors to discuss the current spate of violence against foreign nationals. Uh, what is the focus likely to be? Well, well it, strangely enough, it was in February 2017 when a uh, Home Affairs Minister had a similar meeting with ambassadors, uh, made lots of promises about the fact that they were going to deal with uh, the criminals that were attacking the foreign nationals and deal with a whole range of issues there. This, uh, this time around, it's the Durko Minister and the Police Minister who are meeting with those ambassadors. They had a uh, short photo opportunity about an hour ago. They're in that meeting currently. We understand that they're going to be talking about how to deal with these attacks. But again, you know, the Minister of the Police is going to have to put some action plans on the table, which will probably mean more police uh, personnel going into those townships, going through in squads, well lit, uh, making lots of noise to scare those uh, potential attackers away from doing anything. But again, when they pull out, then the criminal activity continues. So we understand that that meeting will probably come to a close around 2 o'clock local time, and uh, our colleague will have a report on that later uh, in the evening. Karen. Okay, thank you very much. That was CGTN's Angelo Coppola there in Johannesburg on those xenophobic attacks. We are going to short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... Egypt announces that it's exporting 19 military armoured vehicles to Burundi. And Chinese Premier Li holds talks with New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in Beijing. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. Perina Karibe in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. I'm 
News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Egypt has announced that it's exporting 19 military armoured vehicles to Burundi. A step military experts in Cairo hailed as a new chapter in the country's industrial capabilities. Late last year, Cairo invited African military officials to attend its first defence exhibition. The event aimed to market Egyptian military products to African and Arab countries. Here's Adel El Mahrouhi with more. Egypt is entering a new chapter of military production. The Arab Organization for Industrialization announced an arms exportation deal with Burundi. 19 FAT 300 armored vehicles will be produced in the first African deal announced this year. For long, African countries have been importing from Egypt light weapons like rifles, machine guns, mortar shells and other projectiles. The significance of this agreement with Burundi is that it moves Egypt to heavy military machinery exportation, which Egypt has been giving a lot of focus in the field of military production. Based on the designs of the German armored vehicle TH390, Egypt developed FAH. With its multi-purpose design, FAH 300 can be used to transport soldiers equipped with heavy machine guns or rocket launchers. Egypt benefited a lot from the experiences of foreign countries like China, South Korea and Pakistan. We have military cooperation with them and their joint military production programs. With France, for example, we've produced high-tech heavy machinery like the Gazelle helicopter and the Gowin frigates. Egypt's first defense expo, edX, has opened opportunities for exportation. Beside the economical added value to the country, Egypt aims to enhance its military production capabilities and become a hub for military production and trade in Africa. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. The Somali government has been reshuffling top military commanders in a bid to improve security. There's been a wave of deadly al-Shabaab attacks in the capital Mogadishu, targeting hotels and ministries. General Abdi Hassan Mohammed, formerly a military attaché posted in Saudi Arabia, has been appointed the new deputy chief of staff of the country's armed forces. He replaces General Odawa Yusuf Rage, who's been promoted as the new infantry commander. General Abdi Rashid Abdullahi Shire serves as his deputy. Admiral Abbas Amin has been made the new commander of the Somali Navy. <laughs> The Somali infantry forces have been created. Managing these forces used to be the responsibility of the Somali Army Chief of Staff. From today, henceforth, a commander of the Somali infantry forces has been appointed. All the infantry forces and their military academies will be under his management. The military commanders will also be categorized and all the commanders serving under the Somali infantry forces will be under the command of the infantry chief. <laughs> In Tunisia, protesters took to the streets during the 30th Arab League summit on Sunday. Arab leaders have strongly rejected Washington's recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the occupied Golan Heights, which were seized from Syria during the Arab-Israel War in 1967. The anti-Israeli demonstrators briefly scuffled with security forces in the capital Tunis as the summit renewed a call for the establishment of a Palestinian state. Here's CGTN's Adnan Shawashi with more from Tunis. Tunisian President Beji Qaidi Sipsi said that challenges and threats facing the Arab region cannot be solved separately. He urged Arab leaders to reinforce confidence and cooperation between them. It is important to preserve and to regain the initiative to solve our problems by our own means, which requires to overcome first all the disputes and conflicts, improve the Arab environment and foster real solidarity bonds between us. The Arab League slammed U.S. moves to undermine Syria's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. 
We jointly condemn U.S. recognition of Israel over control of the Golan Heights. The decision will only escalate tension in the region. The Golan Heights are Syrian-occupied lands. Participants agreed on the importance of a political agreement and peace settlement in Libya under the auspices of the Arab League, the UN, the African Union and the EU. Preventing an escalation of the crisis in Libya is a priority for all Arab states. Organizing a Libyan reconciliation forum and holding elections this year in Libya will guarantee security. Otherwise, the situation will be out of control in the whole region. Arab leaders called for a firm determination to identify the causes of the failures in the Arab joint action, which will help Arab states unify their vision and reclassify the priorities. The Secretary General of the League of Arab States warned against the alarming security situation in the region. Ahmed Abulghid said the only way to preserve sovereignty and territorial integrity of a state is the initiation of a genuine political settlement process in Syria, Yemen and Libya and to prevent any attempt of foreign interference in Arab affairs. Abdel Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Over to Sudan now, where President Omar al-Bashir's party has postponed the country's general convention indefinitely. The convention was to elect a new chief after the veteran leader handed the party's leadership to his deputy. The general convention of the National Congress party is held once every four years. Sudan has been rocked by deadly protests since December, resulting in Bashir's declaration of a nationwide state of emergency. The country is scheduled to hold its next presidential election in 2020. According to the NCP's charter, the chief of the party becomes its candidate in the election. The board approved the leadership's recommendation to postpone the party's general convention and to authorize the commissioner members of the leadership bureau and the Shura Council to develop a roadmap to complete the building of their organization where the general conference was supposed to be held in April, but the convention is postponed because of the current situation in the country. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is in Beijing meeting with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. The two sides signed four new agreements on Monday during her brief visit to China. The two countries hope to move forward after some friction last year. CTTN's Wu Guoxie reports. A trip postponed and shortened following terror attacks last month in her native New Zealand. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was welcomed by Chinese Premier Li Keqiang Monday at the Great Hall of People. Originally planned as a three-day trip to Beijing, Ardern trimmed it into one. Premier Li rendered his condolences to victims as their bilateral talks began. Li says China values its relationship with New Zealand. We should improve our mutual political trust, increase people-to-people -people exchanges, and seek the greatest common divisor in ties based on equality and mutual respect. Arden says New Zealand is proud of its relations with China, including the free trade agreement signed in 2008. I did, though, want to visit Beijing at this time to underline the importance that we place on our relationship with China. It is one of our most important and far-reaching relationships. Following Monday's meeting, four agreements were signed as the two governments agreed to avoid double taxation, increase agricultural cooperation, and carry out more financial talks and scientific research projects. China is now New Zealand's largest trading partner and second largest source of foreign tourists. The 2019 China-New Zealand Year of Tourism opened Saturday in Wellington. Arden is visiting China for the first time since taking office in 2017. The visit was first scheduled late last year, but China withdrew the invitation at the time following strained political ties and it was only rescheduled recently. The two countries had disagreement after New Zealand banned Chinese telecom company Huawei from providing 5G technology to a local carrier. 
Premier Li says China hopes both countries can provide convenient and transparent environment for companies investing in each other. Analysts say New Zealand's approach in dealing with China is wiser and more pragmatic than other Western countries because it doesn't let differences interrupt normal communication and exchanges. Wu Guoxiu, CGTN, Beijing. Now to the latest on the Brexit saga. British Prime Minister Theresa May is considering a possible fourth attempt to get her deal through Parliament this evening. This comes after MPs resoundingly rejected it on Friday. The opposition Labour Party on Sunday declared it may be time for another no-confidence vote in May's government. The head of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, earlier said the bloc has been patient over Brexit, but patience runs out. Turning to Ukraine now, an exit poll shows a comedian with no political experience is leading in the country's presidential election, though he is far short of a majority needed to win outright in the first round. The poll said the comedian Volodymyr Zelensky garnered the most votes with 30 percent. Incumbent President Petro Poroshenko was in a distant second place with 18% support. He was closely followed by former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, who, 14%, who had 14% of the vote. The top two candidates will face off in a presidential runoff on April the 21st. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. You're watching breaking news on CGTN. Recap of our top stories now. In Algeria, President Abdelaziz Bouteflika has named a new caretaker government. The statesman has kept the people holding the positions of Army Chief of Staff and the Defence Minister. He's appointed new people to fill the posts of Finance Minister, Energy Minister and Foreign Minister. There have been weeks of protests demanding an, an, demanding an end to Bouteflika's 20-year rule. In Mozambique, the number of cholera cases has jumped to 271. The number has almost doubled in the past 24 hours. The port city of Beira has in the meantime recorded its first cholera death since the cyclone. According to health officials, the country has been battling to control the epidemic in the cyclone-hit central city. The Chinese government has since sent doctors to help fight the cholera outbreak. In South Africa, politicians have condemned the xenophobic attacks in the coastal city of Durban. Foreign nationals who reside in the city's informal settlement 
were attacked last week. Many sought refuge in community halls, mosques and police stations. The xenophobic attacks continue to dominate news headlines and Twitter. President Cyril Ramaphosa says xenophobia has no place in South Africa. Enkwazazana Dlamini Zuma has pleaded with South Africans not to attack fellow Africans. And New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is in Beijing meeting with Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. The two sides signed four new agreements on Monday during her brief visit to China. The two countries hope to move forward after some friction last year. And those are the top stories that we're covering for you. We've got all the business news coming up for you after the break, including... South Africa set for highest petrol price in five years. And UK flower industry thrown into confusion as Parliament fails to agree on the withdrawal deal from the EU. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. You've got to get out, go there, and you'll find them. In the bazaars of Casablanca. Among the crowds in Cairo. We come to visit Cairo, the ancient capital of Egypt. Along the waters of the Nile. Along the sands of the Sahara. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. No one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. In South Africa, strong oil prices and a weakening rand have combined to set up another massive fuel price hike that comes into effect this month. According to the Central Energy Fund, the retail price of octane petrol is set to rise to 9 cents per litre inland, while on the coast it's set at 8 cents. Petrol price by litre is set at $1.13, the steepest since April 2015. With the country's revenue shortfall of more than $2.9 billion, the Treasury has imposed levies that will fund the coffers. However, consumer price inflation has left the repo rate unchanged at 6.75%. Meanwhile, in Tunisia, fuel prices there have increased by about 4% in an effort to rein in its budget deficit and meet its financial reforms. The price of petrol per litre is set to increase by 3.9% to 7 cents. The Tunisian government raised petrol prices four times in 2018. It's facing pressure from the International Monetary Fund to trim its budget deficit. The increase in fuel and electricity bills is aimed to offset a rise in oil prices that is putting pressure on strained public finances. Tunisia has faced an economic slump since 2011 following the overthrow of its leader, Zinel Abedin Ben Ali. A preliminary report into the fatal crash of an Ethiopian Airlines jet that killed 157 people last month is set to be released today. This is a key step towards explaining a disaster that has rocked the credibility of US plane maker Boeing. The crash was the second in months involving a Boeing 737 MAX 8, which triggered a worldwide grounding of the fleet. The findings are expected to identify if the aircraft's anti-stall system was faulty. The missing 737 sensor is said to be a focus of the crash probe. Preliminary reports indicate that the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS, 
was pushing the plane's nose downwards, leading to the disaster. Meanwhile, details are emerging about the final moments of the crashed Ethiopian Airlines flight. The Wall Street Journal reports the pilot said, pitch up, pitch up to the other before the radio went silent. The plane's anti-stalling system has been blamed for the disaster, which killed all 157 people on board three weeks ago. Soon after taking off, the plane's nose began to pitch down. It crashed only six minutes into the flight. Egypt's government this week approved the state budget for the fiscal year to June 2020, targeting a deficit of 7.2% GDP growth of 6.1% and a debt-to-GDP ratio of 89%. The 2019-2020 budget has been based on an exchange rate of 18 Egyptian pounds per dollar and international oil prices of $68 per barrel. Egypt's fiscal year begins in June every year. CGTN's Yasser Hakim has more. The government is aiming to reduce the deficit to 7.2% from a current 8.4%. The targeted economic growth in the next fiscal year is 6.1% from 5.5%. But how will this be achieved? The priority is to cut down on expenditure. And it's clear in the budget that the plan is to scrap subsidies on fuel and electricity which take most of the revenue, especially the 92 and 95 octane, that's highly subsidized by the government. But where will the saved money from expenditure cuts be channeled? First of all, to maintain national security and combat terrorism. Then comes expenditure on education and health services. It's extremely important to improve the quality of public services and social security programs for Egyptians. Developing the education system in schools and also hospitals and health insurance for the poor are high on the agenda. Some Egyptians have voiced their opinions about the announced budget. Let's start with improving the educational system, developing the schools and reviewing the curriculum to help students become more creative, like Norway and Europe as a whole, which doesn't exist here. We need more subsidies and services because the population is increasing, but the funds for services are not keeping up to sustain our needs. For most experts, the main challenge for the government is to repay the mushrooming international and local debt. The draft has been welcomed by the National Assembly, but for most of the public, they're focusing on whether the government will succeed in reducing prices and the unemployment rates to 9.3% as promised in the draft. Yas Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. The political chaos surrounding Britain's impending exit from the EU has left many businesses unsure about how their company might deal with trade. One sector which is definitely feeling the heat is the flower industry. CGTN's Hannah Huxter has been meeting florists in London to hear their thoughts. Few gifts could bring the same joy and emotions as a bouquet of fresh flowers. As well as putting a smile on your face, it's also a billion-dollar industry in the United Kingdom. There are nearly 5,000 florists across the country. But the confusion over Brexit and the possibility of leaving the European Union without a deal has created a sense of unease. My concern was always that um, the political class who were against it would combine to frustrate it, and that's exactly what's happening. Don't talk to me about Brexit. I hate the whole concept of Brexit, Brexit but um, oh, I still buy them. But the kind of the stable structure of life in the UK is likely to change, I think. A fear that is shared from local market storeholders to expensive florists in London's West End. It's the fear of the unknown and what is going to happen, but of course nobody can answer that, and that's what's frustrating. And I think it's the, it's the, it's the supply, the physical supply chain, that's the main concern. If tariffs come in, we may have to consider increasing our prices, but at the moment we're not, because nothing as far as we're concerned is changing. For just over 110 years, flowers like this have made their way to UK via the Netherlands. But Brexit uncertainty means that trade model could be affected by tariffs and delays at the border, possibly withering the profits of places like this and causing some to rethink that traditional trade model. Like Ed Scanlon has sought a new way of doing things, 
The former florist now runs a price comparison site for flower shops. When we looked at the supply side of it, nothing about this is political at all. Everybody loves flowers. It was just a case of get, meeting the demand. So flowers are shipped in from China, from Asia, uh, Kenya, a lot of well, in fact, all of Africa. Uh, they're flown into Holland. So we thought, instead of going from the two points of the triangle, why don't we just fly them into Heathrow, because that's an international hub as well. But we've just reconfigured the transportation routes. Even if tariffs do appear later on, the money that we will save in transport will outweigh these. Many businesses are fearful of the Brexit upheaval, but for some in the flower industry, this could be an opportunity to explore pastures new. Hannah Hoxter, CGTN, London. We are going to a short break now. Don't go away. Lots more to come, including... About 90 tattoo artists from around the world attend the tattoo convention in Cape Town, South Africa. When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Do you see fast-growing, endless deserts and parched earth? Or do you see the biggest opportunity for an agricultural revolution in a generation? Do you see crowded, unplanned cities or vast, untapped markets? Do you see a population at risk? Or do you see a billion-strong opportunity to grow the next wave of multi-billion dollar firms in Africa? When you look at Africa, what do you really see? Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panater, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. In Kenya, hundreds took part in a run today aimed at promoting China's Belt and Road Initiative. Officials from the Chinese Embassy in Kenya also joined in at Nairobi's Karura Forest. The global running event has already been held in 22 out of the 44 markets across the development initiative, which intends to build a trade and infrastructure network connecting Asia with Europe and Africa through the ancient trade routes of the Silk Road. Started Chartered Bank is the organiser behind this relay and they've pledged to facilitate additional financing of at least $20 billion by 2020 for the Belt and Road Initiative. Critical Mass Nairobi, a cycling group, is sharing the environmental and health benefits of getting on the bike. The group organises monthly rides around the Kenyan capital city of Nairobi. Asatal has more. Ready, pedal, go. These cyclists are taking part in Critical Mass Nairobi. Once a month, cyclists gather in Nairobi's Jivanji Gardens before heading on a 10-kilometer bike ride around the Kenyan capital city. Critical Mass looks to encourage more people to get on bikes. Critical Mass began with the hope of getting more people cycling again because we realized people are not cycling, a lot of people are stuck in traffic. Critical Mass was founded in 1992 in the American city of San Francisco, but now it is hosted in hundreds of cities around the world. It's gained traction here in Nairobi, where traffic and air pollution remain a problem. Traffic jams are a common sight in the capital, with some participants and residents seeing cycling as a way to alleviate the problem. The traffic in, in, in Nairobi I think it's, it's the future. People should embrace biking. As well as trying to get Nairobians to be more active, Critical Mass also looks to make the city more biker friendly. 
For Jimmy Karumba, this mission gets personal. A professional cyclist, he volunteers for critical mass by mapping out the route ahead of time. He was hit by a bus, locally referred to as a matatu. Both his legs broke, and he spent six months in recovery. Um, when people are taught driving school, they need to be told that they are the cyclists. You need to respect them. And also us as cyclists, we need to, to know the rules of the road. Jimmy continues to pedal on, hoping to share his passion of cycling and spread the message on its environmental benefits. Asatal, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Tattoo enthusiasts descended on the third South African International Tattoo Convention in Cape Town. Held at the v and waterfront, tattoo artists from 15 countries showcased their talents over the weekend. CGTN's Astatal again reports. At the South African International Tattoo Convention, tattoo artists from all over the world have joined the country's homegrown talent to ply their trade. Held over three days in Cape Town, the event focuses on intimacy and authenticity. Here, visitors can engage with the culture of tattooing and even leave with a work of art on their skin. It's a buy invitation event and we invite 90 tattooers to participate which we do purely on their sort of culture and style of tattooing. It's not necessarily the biggest name, but it, it's very much about an authentic artist. Um, so we have, uh, I would say, like a 70-30 split within that 90 that is international versus local. These tattoo artists are serious about their craft. Each has their own unique style, but many draw on oriental influences. I feel Asian style's got more power to it, got a lot more soul just in the imagery. I tried to adapt more loose lines so it looks like it's kind of in a Chinese paint strokes instead of connected lines that form a hard solid image. I went for a, um, a knife and a, a rose. It's a bit more sexy but also dangerous, so very cool, yeah. In its third year, the convention might not be big on counting foot traffic, but has managed to attract sub-2,000 people. With tattooing now part of mainstream culture, the crowd looks forward to more original talent in the years to come. Astatal, CGTN. We have all the sports news coming up for you after the break, including... Female referee paving way for women in the male-dominated sport.